Okay, well, we'll get started. It's 5.02. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm super excited to introduce our guest speaker, Mark Taylor, and for, for our Hemp by Hands lecture series. Mark is an associate professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He has worked in the fields of interior design, construction management, architecture, and scenic construction for the film industry. His experiences have taken him across US, Sri Lanka, and Haiti. He was the architectural faculty lead for the University of Illinois Solar Decathlon projects in 2009 and 2011, which he will also be talking more about this evening that involves his research with hempcrete and grasscrete. And I'll let him explain what grasscrete means. <laughs> but in 2019, Mark became the chair of the detail and fabrication program area with a vision to strengthen collaborations with the community and industry partners. So thank you, Mark, for coming today and speaking with us. We are super excited to have you. And so if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and put the questions in the chat box. Hey. OK. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us here uh, this evening. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Sorry, just getting myself comfortable. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about hempcrete uh, or hemp and grasscrete tonight. Um, and um, it's a, a, a project that's developed over <laughs> many years and uh, it's been interesting as I've been working on this presentation in the past few days, I've, I've resurrected a, a presentation that I, um, I gave back in about 2019, I think. Um, and then there was some missing, missing components uh, that I've now added in. So it's a little bit technical at the beginning maybe, uh, well, maybe a little conceptual at the beginning, then it gets technical, and then um, and then towards the end, I've got some videos to kind of really encapsulate everything. So if I do bore you with the technicals, uh, by the time we get to the recap with the videos, I think it'll, you know you'll be fully excited again. So I'll shoot through this and, and see how it goes. Okay. So the presentation is going to be, um, it started off as a collaboration with a graphic designer and a mechanical engineer, as well as myself as a professor from architecture. And we, we collaborated uh, investigating the properties of, and the potentials of agricultural fibers, uh, initially for paper making, and then for materials for the building industry. And I guess the whole um, philosophy that we've, we've kind of were in working with, particularly my collaborator in graphic design, um, Eric Benson, um, looking and thinking in terms of uh, circular economies, like the connection between where things come from and where they go and where they go after they've been there. Um, so uh, the sort of conceptual part, um, I kind of, I was putting this presentation together. I, just, I got my mind thinking back uh, to those ideas. And so I put introduced a couple of extra slides at the beginning of this presentation when I was really kind of thinking, what were we trying to do when we were looking into this research? So the first stages uh, were very much in collaboration with, as I said, Eric Benson, the graphic designer, who was interested in looking at um, um, waste products from, the, from a very industrialized agricultural landscape in, in the Midwest. Um, and then in collaboration with a student run farm, which was much more locally based. Um, and then um, there was also another student initiative at that time to make a, a, a woody perennial polyculture, uh, which we'll see some photographs of in a minute, where it's more instead of just one expanse of corn or beans, um, it's kind of into, into, um, intermingled with um, uh, fruits and, uh, and grazing crops. So it's pretty interesting. And, and that initial stage was how Fresh Press was born. And um, Veronica was part of uh, Fresh Press for a while. And I think that's one of the reasons where she's got to where she is right now, as well as inviting me back here to, to speak today. Um, OK, so as I said, the, the research took place uh, in the University of Illinois in Champaign um, and primarily out at the um, on the fields, the the agricultural fields that we have 
uh, here in, in Champaign, part of the university where the research is conducted. But uh, I think everybody's pretty familiar with the landscape around the Midwest. It pretty much looks the same as far as you can see in terms of its fields of, of corn one year and then maybe beans the next year and then back to corn. Um, a very sort of industrialized monoculture. And that's what I, my mind kind of wandered, wandered to that um, a little bit today. Um, so uh, I can't imagine thinking what the end of the summer's like and because uh, it's been so cold down here and I think it's been cold for you up there too. But um, so at the end of the summer into the autumn, we start to see um, scenes like this where uh, uh, combine harvesters are going through the uh, fields and basically just trying to capture what's at the top of uh, this combine, just the kernels of, uh, of the corn. And basically everything else is thrown out the back as, as waste. Um, and you can see what was in the field before and the small element that's brought out that has a value. Um, so we were looking at, at what was the potential for that, that waste that was being thrown out the back. And so I kind of always, I've always wondered, and well, I might as well try and answer that question for myself today. It's like, so what are, what are in those fields and what is it producing? And uh, I've got some notes here from today. So it's kind of interesting that um, about 12% um, of what is grown in that field, we can either eat or drink. 50%, um, um, and then maybe if you include the export, maybe 60% goes to animal feed. And then interestingly, uh, about 30% um, goes, to, um, goes to fuel, which in the light of current event is actually quite, kind of interesting that uh, um, with uh, the shock of fuel prices right now, how what we're growing, we're basically growing things to, to drive cars. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know where that leads us, but uh, just in the terms of being aware of uh, what is going on around us, I think that's interesting. Um, and then, as you can see here, I love this picture. It's got uh, typically what we see in the landscape in the foreground, where we've got the residue of corn, which heavily uh, pulls uh, nutrients out of the soil um, from the year before. And then we've got the soybeans that are uh, nitrogen fixing, putting uh, goodness back into the soil. Uh, in the foreground, in the foreground, so this in the foreground is a sort of a typical Midwest uh, image, but then in the background we've got this polyculture where there's actually harvesting of grasses going on, and um, and then these are currants uh, and um, pear trees that are grown in the foreground in the background there. Um, so this is very interesting research. It was a student that and a faculty that. Uh, initiated this project and it's still ongoing, although it's kind of moved out of the realm of the university, somebody else has taken it on as an interest. But uh, the nice thing about that landscape is that the ground is always covered. And so the potential for carbon sequestration into the soil is much greater. The re reduction of soil runoff is a lot greater. So um, I always love that project it's, and uh, the building that we worked on, which we'll see later on is very adjacent to, to these fields. As for the, so we did a little bit on uh, corn, um, soybeans, soybeans a little bit better. Uh, what have we got for soy, soybeans? Um, well, on the meal, I guess still high percentage, 97% um, of, of the produce of a, of a, of a soybean uh, goes to animal feed, 3% uh, for us as soy milk or tofu or however you like to eat your soy. Um, but interesting on the oil side of things, uh, 60, 61% um, in terms of, of food, 31% to biodiesels, um, or 40% if you sort of take in ind other industrial uses. So I kind of I didn't make any conclusions of this. I was just mulling over these these things as I was putting this presentation together. Basically, I guess my big takeaway is what we grow is really in those fields is primarily food for other animals, not us. And uh, then that led me to look into meat consumption and how trends towards uh, rising in wealth and equity, um, or wealth, well, I don't know about equity, right, is in uh, uh, income 
uh, more meat ten tends to get consumed. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but it was just some reflections that I, I had um, as I was putting this presentation together today. And then another thing that I thought I should look into today was, so what is the potential for um, sequestering carbon? Um, and uh, this is a very just a uh, research paper that I had a very brief look at. And it's inter interesting to see that um, carbon is uh, sequestered ma mainly in grasses, uh, in the roots of grasses, which I think is very interesting. Um, and so that when we start to look at Miscanthus in a little while, you'll see that that is a rhizome plant. So the, the, there's no so that you don't sow this plant every year. Those roots are just going down and going down and, and putting carbon down into the soil. So in terms of um, the potential for grass as a, as a way of sequestering carbon, I think is, is very interesting. And, and right at the end of the presentation, we also look at that in relation to um, uh, hempcrete. Okay, so a little close, further close up of uh, that beautiful uh, polyculture that I like. Um, and then these are the other things that are grown um, on, the for on the farm. So the corn, uh, and this is the stubble that's left. Um, and, then, and then this is Miscanthus. Uh, the Miscanthus project at the University of Illinois is, is a pretty important project um, funded initially by BP. Uh, they were hoping that they could get a, um, a fuel, a liquid fuel out of Miscanthus, but that, that never materialized. So primarily the material gets used uh, in a bio furnace. It just gets burnt for heat. Um, and um, it ended up that we did our hempcrete walls in the building where that bio furnace is, which we'll, we'll see in a little bit. But here you can also see how, you know, there's one less journey up and down uh, the, the fields um, to um, plant this each year. All that happens essentially is harvesting. You just come through and you just harvest and then it will grow back and uh, you have another a great biomass of material. Um, and so this is a very interesting material to work with, Miscanthus. It's not a um, indigenous grass, uh, but it isn't, it's also not an invasive grass because it is basically grown on a rhizome. Okay, um, so this is fresh press. And so the early stages of the research um, we were working, I was working with uh, Eric Benson, and we were looking at these different uh, agricultural waste fibers produced paper, and then we got funding uh, to look at paper, uh, look at these fibers in three dimensions. And uh, early stages, uh, I think these were hand harvested uh, corn stalks left after um, the, the fields have been uh, uh, harvested for, for corn. And then this is the miscanthus, which um, gets harvested uh, by machinery. And just I just think I dug, dug my head, hands in the bins and, and stole a few um, miscanthus stalks and or that had already been chopped up, um, which is a very important. I think is when we look later on in this presentation in terms of sourcing materials and the amount of processing involved, uh, the miscanthus is a very good in terms of there's not a lot of processing. You just grow the stuff and you chop it down. And as you chop it down, you basically produce it in a, in a, in a manner that can be used for um, creep walls, um, hemp, not hemp creep, but miscanthus creep walls. So that's what we did, which we'll see in a minute. So the initial stage uh, focused more towards the paper side of things and just doing some analysis within uh, the materials that we had access to, the size of fibers um, and, uh, and what they were looking for. So the ones that are highlighted here are the ones that are more towards what would be used for paper making and the ones in the, the sort of the fours or the three over here in the miscanthus, um, this woodier um, material, that's what we're looking for to build our hempcrete walls or grasscrete walls. And I'm going to focus mainly on, on hemp because there's a long history of hemp being used, goes back to the times of, of the Romans or maybe even before, using hemp um, and a lime binder um, as plasters um, and, and things like that. So there's quite a bit of, there's a lot of uh, literature and a lot of experience with working with hemp. And these other two 
materials were looked at, I looked at primarily because it was still when this <laughs> research began quite hard to source hemp in the UK, sorry, in, in the US. Um, and uh, that since then that's changed. So there is more industrial hemp available, but um, getting hold of it processed in a way that's, that you want to use it is still expensive here. So onto the practicalities um, of what a mix is uh, for, for hempcrete. Um, it's basically by volume of four uh, of the fiber to one of the lime binder to one of the water. Um, add the water slowly so that you don't get it too soggy. You're really looking uh, to get a mix where you can form it into a, a nice a consistent ball shape and it and it doesn't fall apart. Um, these were the initial um, uh, samples that I made, um, just getting an understanding of the material, uh, mixing the dry materials first and then adding the water. Um, and the, the hemp that I uh, had to source for this uh, research, uh, I did look at costs in the in the US and it was just prohibitive. So I ended up getting my uh, hemp out of a supplier out of Chicago, but he was importing it either from uh, France or the UK, who have quite a long history of producing hemp, and also the other side of it, which is processing it, getting it, getting the different value values out of the material. So this is what we're looking for: a nice, consistent uh, ball that doesn't fall apart. Um, those that are going to take part in the workshop. This is uh, what you'll be working at producing first thing. Um, just get so you don't get your um, your mix too dry or too wet. Um, I think actually too dry is probably more dangerous than too wet. I mean, you don't want to be too wet, but if you if you're too dry, the the walls will actually crumble apart. And I've, I've got some examples of our samples that did that. I was warned about not making it too wet, and uh, I actually went the other side and went too dry and, and our first samples kind of fell apart. And then this is the corn. So you can do what you can do with hemp, you can do with corn. Um, and these are, these are small samples. Um, and it's basically, you make the mix and then you just press it down, tamp it down, either this I was doing with my hand or, you, or with a, a block and you, and you just compress it lightly. You want to keep a little bit of air in there, um, but uh, it's, so quite a quite a satisfying process, and then because these were samples that we, I was going to test later on for uh, their thermal conductivity, I made sure that they were, were flat, um, so that the when I put on the heat um, on the top of them, that it was a uniform temperature. So here are my first failings. Um, so this is an early corn one, and I think the corn. Uh, particularly sucks up a lot of the water, uh, so uh, it behaves quite differently than uh, hemp. Uh, and actually, if you and I, if you actually look into the um, the properties of the of the different plants, uh, the properties of or the constituent parts, the the lignans and the um, oils and the um, cellulose contents, miscanthus and hemp are very are very similar. A corn is quite different, um, and I think that's probably why it, it, it sucked up more water. Um, I kind of thought it was going to be a good one, a good uh, material to look at. I mean, I was hoping for it because there's so much of it in the Midwest. It also has these things that look like they're little insulation um, components in them, but uh, it, it, in in this sample, it didn't work so well, and and I'll show you later on. Um, the issues that we had when we built it in, in a main in the main wall, and then I mean it looked fine here. This is a corn uh, mix that looks nice. This must have been fresh out of the out of the mold. And then this one, this is the miscanthus. Again, this is holding together pretty well. Okay, so as the research moved into uh, three dimensions. Some of the initial findings proved relevant. Um, and then what we needed to move into as we moved into looking at things relating to the building industry. Um, and as Veronica mentioned, my 
um, engagement with um, highly insulated um, solar powered homes, uh, namely the solar decathlon houses that we've built at the University of Illinois. Um, I'm very interested in, if I'm gonna build with a material that's an insulating material, I wanna make sure that it, first that I know <laughs> what capacity it has to insulate a building and then also, um, you know, can I prove it? And how does that compare to other, um, other um, materials that are out there? So, um, so I am not very good with numbers. <laughs> and so what I did was I reached out to somebody who was, but uh, they also gave me some insight as to how, um, I guess I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to know this, this gray uh, rectangle here, this is our, what you can consider our, our um, sample. And the K here is the thermal conductivity. So I wanna know what the thermal conductivity is or actually the opposite of that, what is its resistance? So there's some of the formulas out there, um, Feuer's law, uh, you can turn that into a, an equation. And I guess how equations work if you know certain parameters and there's one parameter that you don't know by doing the math, you can work out the, in this case, the K, the thermal conductivity. So um, as I said, I went to somebody who knew, who was much more trusted than I was. Um, I think even if I had had a stab at trying to work this out, I would never have trusted myself. So fortunately, uh, Kyle Smith actually lives across the road and uh, I was telling him about my research and it was very nice to see him think out the problem and write an equation. And then from writing out his equation, which is a version of the other equation that we saw, he said, and then he worked, then he did a sketch of what the setup would be. So this, I love this, the idea of mechanical engineers working like artists with um, equations. And so this is his sketch of what we need to do based on this equation, which always, I don't know, just still kind of, I find amazing. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through as best I can um, how we built the, the research experimental setup uh, using his sketch as a starting point. So the first equation then gets turned into an even more complicated equation that I even, there's even more complicated, but that, that K is still in there, that uh, um, conductivity is still in there. So um, let's go through and see if we can work, see what else is in there. So total heat uh, transfer coefficient, okay. Perimeter length, I'm not sure about that. Temperature differences, okay. Temperature differences given points to the room temperature, okay. Heat power, okay, so I'm gonna add some heat and the power of that. I'm gonna have a, a plate surface area, okay. There's that one that I really wanna to get to, the thermal conductivity. The temperature differences across this sample and then the plate thickness. So I think within there, there's some things that we know and there's some things that we, that we wanna find out. And so, just going to break down some of these things in the equation. Uh, we're talking in millimeters here. So again, I've got a cheat sheet here to help me with inches. And you can see over here, this is the percentage of error in the calculation. So um, if we have an insulation thickness less than uh, 40 millimeters, uh, we're only going to have an error of about 2%. So we're looking down here, this is about uh, four inches. So we want to have four inches of insulation either side of our sample. So, okay, I get that bit in the equation. Um, I should also tell you that we're gonna have an ice bath at the bottom of this sample. We know that it, we're gonna put lots of ice in there and it's gonna remain at uh, the freezing point. Um, so we know what that is a constant. And then what else are we gonna do in here? Well, we, we wanna keep our ice uh, still uh, cold. So we'll insulate our ice box. And we'll also insulate all everything else around. So as much insulation as possible is going to be good. Then to the size of our, the effect on the sample thickness. So this is our sample. Ideally, I know that hemp works in a big um, uh, in big assemblies. So six inches or or a foot thickness. That's I would have. If I was doing this experiment without 
uh, any input from a mechanical scientist or a mechanical engineer, I would have wanted to have a big sample. But th what this graph shows me here is that the bigger my sample becomes in terms of thickness, uh, the more error that I will have in this calculation. So we kept it down to like an optimum. Uh, so this is uh, 40 millimeters. That's a, so we had an inch and a half sample. So that's why my samples that we saw earlier are pretty thin, not optimum for manufacturing, but okay for, uh, for the equation. Okay, then what else are we gonna do? So we're gonna apply some heat on top of our sample and we, the temperature, not much uh, percentage of error depending on how hot we go. Um, we want it, to, these are again in centigrade, so um, this is about uh, 30, uh, 32 uh, Celsius, so that's uh, around 90 to 100 Fahrenheit, so pretty hot. Uh, you could touch it, but you, it would be feel, certainly feel warm, uh, more than warm. Um, so that's what we chose to get our temperature up to. Okay, is there another one? Okay, and then th here we're heading towards the K, finally, what we want to achieve, what we want, the value that we want to get to the, the um, uh, conductivity. So if we measure the voltage, uh, the, the watt, input the watts and measure the voltage um, and work out what that is at a constant, we can then eventually determine um, what the conductivity of the material is. Okay. So this is what the setup looks like um, in, in real terms, uh, an ice bath. Um, we had an issue of the ice bath not actually connecting to it. There's another plate on the bottom of the sample. So we had to put these fins in so that we could basically make sure that the bottom of the plate uh, remained at um, around freezing point. Um, and then we put in the sample, you can see the sample in here, and then there, here's our, our hot plate. And then uh, we've got um, power cords coming out to um, our little heater here. Well, it's not a heater, it's, it's sending voltage, or sorry, it's sending wattage uh, to heat this plate up. And then we are recording um, the, the voltage coming out, I believe. Um, so, this was, and then everything gets covered in as much insulation so that the outside temperature doesn't affect things. Um, and like many experiments, first time around, doesn't necessarily go to plan. So um, I think we might've had a decimal point in the wrong point place somewhere, and we kind of melted the, <laughs> the insulation. And so we, we cranked things down a little uh, after that, checked our numbers, and then uh, carried on with doing our, tests. I, I, so I've just put this on blur, but I'm, I've got in here, I don't think you'll be able to see this, but I've got all my notes here that I was trying to work out, remember what I was, uh, what I was recording. So, I, and I know that this took a long time. It took um, these experiments to get to that steady state because you needed to get to the steady state to take the recording. Um, it was taking like seven, eight hours to get to a steady state um, where then we could say, okay, this is this is what the voltage is, and then we can add that voltage into the into the equation. And since then, uh, I've made more friends on campus. It's always good to make friends on campus. And now there's a machine uh, that I've located that basically does the same thing, and uh, through a, a similar setup um, with a smaller sample, and it deals with the outside temperature. And in five minutes, it can get uh, it can get similar results. The only downside to this is that it only can deal with small samples and, our, and making our small concrete samples is, is also not that easy because it the nature of the material. But this also brings in another aspect. Um, so we so in addition to the, the hemp fibers, uh, there's also um, the binding element. And so the binding element is, um, is lime, um, which requires a little bit of uh, heat to get to to fabricate that material. Um, it's a bit of like plaster plaster of Paris if you've ever worked with that it um, it's a powder that you heat that you add water to and then it sets over time um, with with the mix and 
it doesn't get super hard. It still is always can be a little bit brittle, um, as opposed to um, this other material with another researcher that I'm working on. These, these are geopolymers. So these are ceramics that set at room temperature. So these are kind of amazing products. And uh, I've been working with hemp and other um, uh, fibers in, with this material, which is much, much stronger, which actually has structural capacity. So I think in a way, maybe this is more the future of where um, hempcrete will go with a new binder with a lower um, carbon footprint and increased um, uh, structural strength. So that's another line of spin-off research that uh, you have when you work at uh, an institution where there's such a lot of interesting stuff going on. Okay, so we're getting to the point where I'm going to conclude the, uh, the technical side of things. Um, so here we have, uh, so we conducted for each sample that I made, we conducted, we conducted three different tests. Um, and then we took the average of that K number. Uh, and then these are just other, other in, uh, representations of that same number. And then over here we have R values. So I don't know if you've ever been to Lowe's and picked up a piece of polystyrene, um, rigid insulation or some fiberglass insulation and it has an R value on it. So this is all super important to um, uh, architects and builders uh, and uh, building scientists because when we build buildings that are gonna hopefully last 50 years, you wanna make sure that they are gonna re require as little heat uh, inputs as possible over their lifespan. And uh, it's been interesting to see that the building codes have got um, more and more stringent over time. Um, and so this is how the building code works. There's different uh, regions with different numbers in them. So I think, believe you are up in six, I'm down in about four or five. Um, and when we get to the next chart, you'll see what the R value is um, required in that climate zone, okay? So for a wood framed uh, building, there's two ways that you can do it. You can either fill your, fill your walls with um, R20 um, of insulation, or you can put R5 outside your building uh, over the structure so that the structure stays uh, warm or, or doesn't get cold from outside. Um, and then you can put a little bit less insulation in the walls. So there's two options. Um, if you're up where you are, because it's colder up there, you need to do both. You need to put uh, R20 in your walls and R5 on the outside. So I got one more chart on the building side. So we're looking at this number here, this R value for the material um, per inch. So this is the R value per inch of hempcrete. And unfortunately, it's not very good. Um, it's R1, okay? Um, as opposed to um, things that you may be more familiar with, fiberglass is R4 per inch. Um, some of the polystyrenes are sort of up in R6 and, or R7 an inch. Um, I kind of try and avoid these high, um, either petrochemical based or high energy to produce uh, materials. I mean, they, they do have their place um, because they're very good at keeping buildings warm. And if over 50 years, if you put less inputs in, then that's a good thing. But there are some other options here. So cellulose, um, insulation, um, which is basically torn up newspaper. Um, you can put that in your walls and that is still going to be better than hempcrete. So that's kind of the little bit of the, on the downer side of the conversation about uh, hempcrete, but I, I've got to be honest, I've got to, I've, <laughs> I've got to tell you that now um, because uh, um, I don't want to leave you with any um, misinformation that hemp Crete is going to save the world. It, it's uh, it's got some values and it's and it's interesting, but it may not be uh, the silver bullet to solve all the world's problems of um, how to insulate buildings. Okay, so back to the rest of the samples. I'll just go through these: hemp, um, corn, 
uh, and miscanthus, they're all around the same. You're getting just about uh, one per inch. So that's why you have to have these thick walls because it hasn't got a lot of um, R value. It hasn't got a lot of thermal resistance. So that really, there's this kind of like uh, the conclusion of phase one um, where we had been working with the paper, uh, we had produced the samples, uh, we put on a little exhibition or we were part of an exhibition and we had uh, data for both the paper and the um, uh, and the thermal resistance properties of, of the material. And then from that stage, uh, we moved into the next case to scale it up. So we looked at doing um, a mock-up wall. So we again, get an idea of what it's like to work with this material. Um, and uh, this is how you, you build. So you have quite thick walls. You use the wood to do the structural elements because it doesn't have any structural capacity. Um, and uh, we, we found out that it takes quite a while to make, uh, to fill these cavities. They're quite big cavities. And so we had, again, cor uh, miscanthus, corn, and uh, I think, um, sorry, hemp was the corner. Um, this is corn and then miscanthus was on the end, I think. And then once we'd uh, cut our teeth on, on working with the material, then we got the opportunity to take this industrial building. And in the background, that's where that uh, polyculture is actually right behind there. Um, they were had this enclosed or unenclosed, uh, uh, basically farm building uh, that was uh, they wanted to use as a place where they could uh, conduct some research. Uh, out of the wind and the weather. Those are hearing today that the, up there you were working outside in a, probably a similar building to this and it's pretty cold. And so that the, and also wind and they were trying to do some very accurate measurements. So it was nice that the university was willing to allow me to experiment with uh, our grass creek walls on this structure. Um, so we worked on producing some drawings. Um, got the, the shipping containers uh, here and then we looked at uh, there was going to be two small walls, and then the other part is um, some loading uh, loading doors. Here's a loading door, or from the outside, here's a loading door. And then this is the cross section, um, sort of in uh, looking into the building, and then this is if you were looking down on the building. And then this is how that wall is made up. Um, basically, the wood structure, putting as we try to put as much. Um, uh, hempcrete or grasscrete in front of that as well, so there was less thermal bridging through the assembly. Um, and then once we had our drawings ready, we could purchase our material. Um, and this is what our material looked like. These are the, the hemp uh, bales. Um, there's some binder in there as well. Uh, these were the corn that we had um, acquired from the fields. Um, we, this was the backup board that we had as a fiber board. Um, in this assembly, it's known as what's known as a breathable assembly. So moisture sort of mitigates through the assembly. Um, and then here's more of our binders. And this is our plaster finish. So I think you know, maybe you don't, uh, the different um, materials that you can get out of hemp. Uh, industrial hemp. So there's two main divisions after you've taken the higher value um, seeds and oils. Um, there's the uh, bast, bast fiber, which is used in paper making um, and fabrics, um, very strong material. Um, and then uh, it's uh, poorer cousin, I guess, is, is kind of a waste product, the herd, and that's what you use in um, in uh, hempcrete uh, construction. So there's different scales. And this is why in the US, as the industry has started to, I mean, it only became legal to grow industrial hemp in all states, I think in 2019. Um, so since then, um, farmers have been looking at like, okay, so I can grow the stuff, that's pretty easy. I put the seeds in the ground, but then, how do I get out all these different high value crops? And there's 
as most things in America, you've got like a small, medium, large version. Um, so this is the small version. This is uh, your sort of hobbyist version. Uh, I think this guy is uh, might, might be out of Hungary or somewhere like that. He created this um, this nice machine that's uh, 12,000 euros. Um, so this is small scale. Uh, this is medium scale, uh, but still your sort of hand feeding in the material and you're getting out your herd on this side and your um, bass fibers out on the other side. Um, and this one will come in at a, about two, $200,000 to get a machine for that. And then if you want to supersize it, uh, you can get something like this, which is known as the hemp train. Uh, my son would love that title, I think. Um, so, um, and this is really working with hemp on an industrial scale where you can load things in uh, off, off a forklift. And they've got a really, they've got a really interesting setup where they're really fine tuning their processing and in, in addition to getting out the, um, the low value herd, the higher value bust fibers, they're also getting green microfibers, they're getting the seeds, they're getting feedstock, they're getting other extractions. So they're getting everything out of, um, out of the, um, the machine. And the thing that I like about this machine for the US market, I mean, it's actually built in Canada, or yeah, this is actually developed in Canada, but this is more suited to the, to the um, uh, US market where as a, as a facility, it's not actually that big. I mean, I don't know what the costs are. Oh, there's the costs. Like, uh, that's, that's uh, I guess, in the realm of ag business, that's probably not unreasonable. So that's, that's, this is where things have moved on um, since, uh, since hemp um, production has become more viable, um, both in the US and Canada. So back to the practicalities. And uh, this is our little experiment with hemp, give you an idea of uh, what, the, what the structure looks like. Um, basically, we've got the something to hold the wall, hold the material in place. This was quite a high wall, and I was slightly concerned not, not having worked with the material. Uh, I didn't want it to fail. I didn't want it to fall out on people. So I added these additional um, uh, reinforcing uh, elements. I don't know if you need them. Probably not, but we put them in for safety reasons. That's that's really just a way. I just didn't want the whole assembly to fall forward for any reason. Probably would, wouldn't happen, but I was over concerned. Um, we bought ourselves a mixer and we had our three bays of material that we were working on. Um, we sort of, this is how you build it up um, step by step. And normally if you were working on a, on a building, uh, you would just have, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about the divisions between the different materials. You just have one sheet across there and it will be a little simpler than what we were trying to do. Um, but it worked out pretty nice. Um, this is uh, one finished wall on the other side. Um, and we did things, mix things up a little bit in here. So on the first uh, wall that we worked on, we had hemp, miscanthus and corn. Um, and we found that the corn wasn't working out so well. So on, our, on the back wall, the other wall opposite, we went with hemp, um, miscanthus, and then a mixture of miscanthus and corn, because I did kind of like some of the properties of the corn, but um, so we mixed it with the hem just to, sorry, mixed it with the miscanthus just to see how it worked out. And this second wall worked out a lot better. And this is a, a little view close up, of what the material looks like. So these elements were just put in place to hold the, uh, the formwork in place and then, um, as we moved up, these tubes were removed and, and then moved up with the assembly. And then the final stage is to put on the plaster coating. And um, so I don't think there's much of a tradition of plastering um, in uh, the US anymore. Drywall has basically replaced uh, wet plastering. Um, in, in the UK, because we have uh, older housing stock, there's, there's still a bit more of a tradition of, of, of working with plaster. Um, but the plasters over there are 
set designed to set very quickly. This is a lime based plaster and it's actually very forgiving. Um, so it's it, it's workable for about two hours as opposed to 45 minutes. So if you ever want to learn to plaster, um, working with a lime based plaster is, is uh, a lot easier and also very satisfying. Mark, so you, can I yes. ask a question? Sure. Um, did you have to pat, like really pound it down? The plaster? No, no, no. The the, uh, the hemp uh, the, and corn. How how did it get so compact? Yeah, it's 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 more of a gentle tapping rather than a heavy pounding. Um, so uh, we we I, I've got a video coming up and you can see it. Oh, okay, they, okay. They just sort of gently. It's a it's a tapping motion. It's nothing. It's okay. not like. <laughs> okay, I'll be patient and wait for the okay. video. Sorry. And it's also not like concrete where you pour concrete and then you have to have vibrate it. I mean that side is that side of things. It's actually quite nice to work with. Okay, thank you. Okay, and so this is our first wall, the wall, the wall that we had some issues with it drying out and cracking, and then we we patched that up, and then this is how we finally finished it. And I I had never plastered before. My research assistant uh, Drew he would never <coughs> plastered before, um, and so. Um, he, uh, we, we learned to do it uh, on this project and it, so we're certainly no experts, but we were pretty impressed with ourselves for what we managed to achieve. Um, it looks pretty smooth. You can go over this. We did have another material to, that we could have gone over again, but we didn't, we kind of settled on this sort of semi rough finish. Uh, it was okay for the environment that it was in. And um, I think we'd been in this building for about, uh, <laughs> I don't know, six to nine months by this stage and uh, they wanted to use it. So we felt like, let's get out of here as soon as we can. Um, okay, so into, so I've got three videos. Well, I, I guess I might, now may be a good time to take a few questions, just brief ones, if there's anything, and then I'll, I'll start into the sort of wrap up with a few videos. Any questions or anything in the chat? We got uh, a question by Iola. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but uh, could clay have been used? Can you use clay as a binder? Yes, that's a good question. Yes. So that's another part. Of, so I guess <clears throat> we went down the rabbit, rabbit hole of um, um, the fibers, getting the fibers was our challenge. And we had the opportunity to use corn and miscanthus. And then another rabbit hole of investigation is going down with like, well, what can you do as opposed to lime binders? And uh, I think, you know, working with clay binders, I actually have a, um, a collaborator um, is actually one of my early research assistants on this project, excuse me. <coughs> who, who was from Ecuador. His cousin is working on some similar systems, and he's working with uh, clay and clay and lime um, uh, plaster finishes. So, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, I don't know much about it. I'm going more in the direction of uh, industrialized approaches to this. So, I'm more interested in that geopolymer, uh, maybe bigger wall assemblies and and walls that do. Things. So I'm kind of moving a little bit. I've done the craft <laughs> with this project and I'm moving more towards the industrial. That's kind of how the US market is, uh, but uh, or part of the US market. But if you do want to go that craft option, yeah, I think looking into clay is, uh, is also interesting. So, okay, we, I've got another point for questions later on. So, if, but if you wanted to uh, put those in, in the chat. Um, so, so I've got a few, a few videos here just to show you some of the process. This is the last bit. Um, does this sound okay? Can you hear the sound? One thing I forgot to turn it up just a little bit. It's kind of okay. hard. To there you go. That's good. Okay. I've got to click the set share sound. I don't know if that's going to make an issue. But... Okay, so this is just showing you uh, the plaster mixing and what we were shooting for. Um, so you can see how it's kind of getting to the consistency that you want. 
And what we're really looking for is a consistency um, where when you pull the mixer out, um, it kind of leaves a hot, it's nice and solid. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what you're what you're aiming for. Um, you can also add a little bit more water while you're working with it. Whoops. Uh, that started a little soon. So the next one is um, the plastering process. Again, so this is the first to <coughs> yard of plaster that I've ever spread in my life. So um, it can be done for beginners. So you have to damp down the wall before you apply it. Um, and I guess if you're working at a more, in, a more commercial speed, uh, I think you actually do want the wall to dry out a little bit first, but I, you know, and, and then damp it down before you apply. Isn't plastering satisfying? <laughs> so there's nothing on the wall. There's there's nothing on the wall. There's no coating. No, it, it just binds into the material. It's into the because it's the the fibers are pretty um, pretty rough anyway. So you don't need to put on like a a metal screed or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. That that's my technique. I can't remember if I. This is my assistant Drew. This is his technique. And I think he did this. I think I did the top uh, quarter of this build of this wall, and then he did <clears throat> this whole wall pretty much on him. Or we together we did the rest of the wall in a in a day. Um, he started off in the morning, and then the key is working with this material um, at its appropriate stages. So there's the stage where you where you get it on. He's going to smooth this down in his wonderful technique. <laughs> I think he could do, do a great cake icing, I think. How fast does it dry? So that's the, that is the nice thing about this material. It doesn't dry super quick. Um, so it goes through, I would say, like three stages of drying. So this is like when it's when it's wet, and um, once you've got it on like this, you want to leave it for, I'm saying about an hour to 45, 45 minutes to an hour, depending how um, uh, how how hot it is in the room. Or so that so that's the first stage, and then the next stage. I think I've got it another video. Oops. So, so when it's in this second, the second stage, we come back and we sort of just fill in any high spots and we sort of rub it down, as you're going to see in a minute. And as you rub it down, you can, you can sometimes see some, you, you don't get high spots, you get low spots. So you have to kind of fill in the low spots and then you keep on, then you come back again. Um, and that, that second period of time drying can, can be about two hours. With the um, hempcrete insulation, do you do, is it necessary to do, I think this is beautiful to do the wall like this, but could you just put it in between studs and then put a drywall sheet up? Or yes, you, yeah, so yeah, that, that's absolutely, yeah, there, as long as you get, as long as you get a breathable type of drywall, again, that's harder to source in the, in the US. Oh. Uh, you'd, you'd have to do a little bit of research on uh, on what kind of drywall you would need, but you need to have something that's a little bit permanent. But yes, you can do shuttering on both sides, and then you just throw the throw the material in and yeah. be done. Yeah, right. Or I guess if you did it like we did with the shuttering, you could put it on the outside. Um, 
but uh, I'll just show a little bit of this. So these are very much sort of historical materials and their application in historic buildings is, is pretty, uh, is particularly like brick, brick um, constructed buildings. Um, a monolithic wall with this material would work very well because of the moisture and it allows the moisture to move through the assembly. Um, How, how strong is the hempcrete when it's mixed with the lime and it you pressed it into the little mold so that you could put it in the little exhibition? How yeah. how strong it like it, how much integrity does that object have? That it, could I break um, it with my hands? Yeah, the, the, thin, the, the, the thin sample you can easily break. Okay. When they get when it gets a little bigger to like a, yeah. a brick, like a like a foot by a foot, it yeah. somehow picks up more structural strength. But it, in terms of building code compliance, you could never say that it is a structural material. It obviously adds structure to a material. It adds some structural integrity, but in the calculations, you can't use it as so. You can't use it so as it, a support. It's just, yeah. it's a filler. I, I mean, it, it would, I mean, it's a pretty solid material once it's, um, once it's set. And so you're racking uh, the racking that the building would have in certain wind conditions would obviously be a lot better, but you can't, by, via the code, you can't say that I'm using insulation as a structural material. So that's why I'm very interested in these geopolymer materials, because these are super strong. They're actually stronger than cements. So mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting in terms of working with, the, again, these are historically old materials. They're just coming back in a, in a new industrialized way um and as again with the, 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 the polymers that you're talking about yeah. are they um i mean will they be biodegradable at, at any point or are they yeah because it it it's really just um it's really just like a ceramic um, okay in a, in okay a, I see. In a, yeah so it's it's okay. uh, it can be broken down it's not a plastic Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically made out of kaolinite. Um, so, okay, so I think I got one more wonderful video. Whoops, it's already started on me. So, um, so this should, this is kind of like a wrap up, uh, a refresher of everything that I've said, I th hope. <laughs> uh, and it, it runs for about seven minutes. Okay, so, uh, and let me know if there's anything wrong with the audio because I, I might have to relaunch a few things, but uh, let's see how we go. I don't know if we hear anything, Mark. Nothing. I, I don't have any audio. Here we are at the energy farm. No. Nope. Uh, looking oh. at some brief and graph. Uh, yeah, I hear something now, but okay. maybe turn up the volume. Maybe that'll uh, help. I think what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share again with the, yeah, I share sound. That's what I forgot to click. Okay. Energy farm, uh, looking at some hemp creek and grass creek walls. Is that better? Um, this research yeah, started back in yeah, 2017. Good. Um, in collaboration with Fresh Press. Um, they were looking at waste agricultural fibers and natural grasses um, to make paper. And I collaborated with Eric Benson and Sam Tofik. And we looked at ways that we could take uh, grass fibers and put it in, think about it in three dimensions. And we got some funding from the Campus Research Board. So we appreciate that. And, um, and I was aware of what was happening in Europe where um, hemp um, had been used with a lime binder to build walls for, for decades, in fact. So back in 2017, when this research began, um, it was actually still quite restrictive to use um, 
hemp in, in the US to actually source it. Um, industrial hemp was pretty hard to actually to get or to grow. Um, so a lot of it had to be sourced from uh, Europe. So when we were doing the research and thinking about how we could move uh, from flat paper to three dimensions, I thought of other uh, grasses that were available locally that we could use. Um, and around in Illinois, uh, as a waste product, corn stover was an ideal uh, plant to look at. And then the other plant uh, on the university was miscanthus. Um, so those two uh, plants we, we looked at and did some initial research on uh, the thermal conductivity of that material. Over there in those far fields, that's where the miscanthus is grown and uh, it's stored. They've just harvested uh, a few weeks ago and it's all ha harvested and in storage over there. Uh, and then later on, it'll be, it'll be brought into this, these bunks here. This is what it looks like when it comes out of the field, which is pretty much the same stuff we've been using uh, in the building itself for the research. And um, beyond here is, the, is a bio furnace. So historically, Hemp has been used with a lime binder uh, since the time of the Romans. Um, it's become a little bit more uh, industrialized, a little bit. Um, and now the typical way, if you're just doing a standard hempcrete wall like this one, um, you could actually buy uh, pre-divided um, up quantities. So typically a bale of hemp like this would, would mix with um, a bag of binder like that. In our case, because we were making our own mixes with our own grasses, uh, we had to deviate a little bit from that and actually work. The ratio is uh, four to one to one. So four of the fiber, one of the binder, and one of water. Um, we had a mixer, so we deviated again a little bit further so that we could use the optimum use of our uh, mixer. Uh, we ended up with quantities of six liters one and a half liters and one and a half liters. So th this was the first wall that we built. And so as we were going, um, and so the, the materials we've got, you can just about make the see the divisions. We've got the hemp here, we've got the miscanthus, and then this is the corn. This is the pure corn stover uh, with, uh, with the lime binders. And um, so some of the lessons that we learned, we were probably moving a, a little bit slowly on here and we probably weren't wetting the wall down. And so some cracks have started to appear. Um, not so much in the hemp, a little bit in the miscanthus, but the, the one that really suffered was, uh, was the corn. I think what we've learned in the process is that it's not really an ideal product it, uh, or an ideal fiber. Um, it performed well in the lab, but when we came out to actually install it, it would, it compressed a little bit more than the other two. So as these walls were growing quite quickly, this one was kind of growing slowly. Um, and then, so that would mean that there's actually more binder in here. So it's going to be interesting once we've got this covered with its final render. Um, when we have a look at this through thermal imaging, um, I'm kind of expecting that this, this bay here will not be uh, performing quite as well as the, as the rest of the wall. We'll see. We still got to finish the outside. Uh, so this pallet here has the two different types of material that we'll put on, which will basically become a plaster finish on the outside of both these walls. And then the other bit of work that we still have left to do is we've got to be, we're going to be burying um, some um, temperature sensors at the back of the wall. And so we will actually end up with having temperature monitoring on the outside of the wall, at the back of this uh, one foot wall assembly, and then on the surface here. And once we've captured that data, uh, we can feed it into a simulation. And then once we've got it in, in a simulation, we can also then um, theoretically say how this building might perform in different climates. So that's gonna be really kind of interesting. So that's the next phase is um, getting the sensors in and uh, putting the plaster finish on the outside. Wow, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, well, the whole situation with COVID has really made people reflect on a lot of things. Obviously, it's been difficult to, to do the research, but 
I think reflecting on what you do as a researcher is very important. And as it relates to this project, it's helped us, oh, we've had to slow down a little bit, and the whole nature of this kind of architecture, it links to circular economies, which may also need to slow down so that you actually become aware of where your resources are coming from and where they're going to. And so it's gonna be interesting in the future whether this kind of architecture or this portion of architecture becomes more into the mainstream. If you look at society in general, historically, uh, organic food was on the fringe and that moved to the center. And you look at Europe, and I also think that Europe has is, is taken more steps towards considering its environment as it considers how it builds its infrastructure. So with this kind of architecture, it's gonna be interesting to see if America can break away from its fast food type of addiction in terms of construction, where quickest and cheapest wins into something that is much more connected both to the land and the area from which it was uh, designed and, and built. So definitely, a, I, I, have, I do have a couple of extra slides that I'm keeping in the background uh, for any questions, which we'll have in a minute, but I do need to really thank uh, the team that helped us get, uh, the, the research get this far. A very big thanks to Veronica for all the work she did in the construction and the video that you've just seen, which is absolutely wonderful and does a great job of um, putting the the research together without any of me stumbling over what I'm thinking about on that particular day. So thank you, Veronica, for being such a really steadfast research assistant uh, on this. And uh, Drew, who also uh, was amazing in, uh, you know, just getting the work finally finished up, um, apart from when you've got to do the monitoring now. And then also I've got to thank the university for, um, and the Student Sustainability Committee, which has basically helped finance this project. So. Um, so that's where I'm going to conclude things until I get some questions and maybe I, I'll need to um, um, uh, delve into my extra questions. I, I, I guess I did have one extra slide. This one here is um, I alluded to in the video where I said I'd be interesting to, interested to see if this concrete wall doesn't perform as well as the rest of the wall. And from this thermal imaging uh, camera that you see is it is actually up at the high end so it actually is performing as well as the you know maybe this whole wall looks like uniform it doesn't look like there's much difference it might actually be picking up a little bit of heat from the from the fire furnace on this side but uh, so I had I hadn't had need to worry about that um, also interesting from the outside you can see um, so this is where the, the grass creek wall is, and it's performing, uh, it, this is from the outside, so you're looking in the opposite to the red, um, it's actually performing better than the spray foam insulation uh, that we're seeing uh, over here. So, and also there's no thermal bridging happening here, where here you can see that the, the, the structural members are being uh, he are heating up. So. Um, and a lot better than the garage door. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the, the, with the research. Um, and uh, at that point, I will, I will stop talking and take questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. That's it's cool to see it all come full circle a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had a question about the hemp plaster because I wasn't there for that section of... Uh -huh. um, that, but did you guys add hemp bass to the lime in the water to-, to Oh, for the, the for the finish? No, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't. okay. No. Was that there- was something we talked about whether we were gonna, were gonna do it. If I, if I had seen it cracking, um, if I'd have seen um, anything like that, I was kind of imagining that we would have done like three coats of, of the plaster but it was such a nice material to work with that we could put it on quite thickly about, I mean, it was probably about half an inch to three quarters of an inch in, in one go. It's, mm -hmm. I, it's more like putting on a, the kind of render that you would have on the outside of a house. I mean, I do have a background in 
in the building industry in the UK. So I have seen plastering going on, although I've never done it before. So I was I was shooting for that kind of what we call in in the UK like an outside render, um, and uh, it 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 seems to have performed very well. No cracking, so there was no need for that extra extra binding. Okay, interesting. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to like unmute and ask any questions if you want to, or put in the chat. But uh, yeah, we can keep it conversational too. <laughs> Well, it's really inspiring. I, I mean, watching even just watching you plaster the wall, I thought, oh, I that will be a beautiful wall. But I was so struck by just how straight and even that grass, as it was pressed into the form, into the that it, yeah. yeah, and that how I anticipated it would be, it wouldn't be so flat. Like when you put the plaster on, that it would be a little rougher and you again you'd have to put more layers on in order to even it out but everything seems so straight and mm -hmm. flat yeah so that's all down to the form getting the form work in yeah uh, and there are there are numbers of different there are different techniques um so the technique that we worked with was working from inside the building out because the building was framed up and it was actually a comfortable way to work on it Mm -hmm. You can also work from the outside in if your if your ambient temperatures are fine. So that's where you would put the plasterboard on the inside, and then you would build out your your mm -hmm. hemp to, towards the outside, and then you may finish up with um, like a siding material, and then so th there's many many different ways to to work with this material. Another option where you would have it more uh, a rougher surface would be applying it with a um, like a shot creed where you you can blast this out of a oh. out of a machine and you can you can use it like that. That's another way of doing it. That's again, that wouldn't what, disturb the surface of the hemp of the. It becomes a little pitted, uh, but yeah. that's they often do that from the outside. So you'd have your inside or on the inside, and then you would fire your hempcrete from from outside against the wall and you know it's a, it's a, it's not a particularly heavy material to work with especially compared to concrete or something like that mm. 